Hey everyone, you're listening to Die Logos, a Harker Philosophy Club podcast. I'm Akshay. I'm Sophia. I'm Quentin. I'm Bauer. So today we're joined by Bauer, a club member, and Quentin, our former officer. We'll be talking about the Force in Star Wars, the different types of Force, the different metaphysical interpretations of it, and how it tracks with different human religions. Yeah, this is a brief introduction. So uh, George, the Force as a idea was uh, written and imagined by George Lucas who is a writer, director, et cetera. You all probably know about him if you're familiar with Star Wars. Um, in his words, he wrote The Force as a way to awaken a certain kind of spirituality in young audiences uh, and made it as a non-denominational religion distilled from the essence of all religions, uh, particularly in terms of there being some sort of unifying higher power or being and how that being or power determines what is good and what is evil. So we're going to talk about that and kind of how different religions informed and contributed to elements of the Force as we see in the Star Wars properties. So first, we're going to distinguish a little bit between the two different types of Force that the Star Wars canon accepts. First, there is the living Force. It flows through everything, everything that is in the universe, including non-living things, and there's the cosmic force. It is kind of on the broader scale and deciding the entire fate of the universe. The cosmic force also has a will, which we will return to later. But Akshay is going to talk a little bit about um, how the living force relates to a classical philosophical position. Yeah, so that classical philosophical position is monism. Monism is the idea that everything in the universe, you, me, uh, the microphone I'm speaking into, the uh, speaker that you're listening to this from, all of this is made out of kind of one predominant material. Um, usually that material was God. If you look at kind of philosophies like Spinoza's philosophy or religions like certain sects of Hinduism, they all thought that God was this kind of ever-present material throughout the universe and that everything in the universe was made out of that material. And so because it's a religion, usually you would justify this through kind of common religious arguments. There would be a creation myth behind it, something like that. Another way to justify monism philosophically is the idea of Occam's razor. Occam's razor is the principle that between competing explanations, the simplest is most likely to be true just because each part has some level of falsity. So because there are multiple parts, it's more likely that that whole explanation is false. And so using Occam's razor, the simplest explanation would be that all things are made of one material rather than several different kind of materials all created in some kind of big bang. And so monism is usually used to contrast with other types of religions. Usually these are dualistic religions or philosophies that believe that, are, that there are kind of two predominating forces or two kinds of matter present. And so in the, an example of this would be the idea of a mind-body dualism that you might have heard of um, if you're talking about enlightenment philosophy, the idea of a distinction between the mind or what we can reason and the body or kind of what we can experience or sense. There are also religions like Taoism or Buddhism that also believe um, that or kind of theorize about a broad dualism or conflict like uh, yin and yang or the Tao. And finally, there are other sects of, of Hinduism that believed that there was kind of a dualist world that existed. Yeah, one slight difference between monistic philosophy and the Force in Star Wars is that the I it's generally not claimed that the Force comprises of things in the Star Wars universe, but rather that the Force kind of exists or flows through uh, all forms of matter. And the Star Wars universe is kind of a slight distinction between uh, those two. The Force actually bears a lot of similarity to one monistic or uh, non-dualist philosophy, and that is the Olam of the Aztecs, something that differentiates, um, kind of what Quentin was talking about, differentiates Olam from other uh, monistic philosophies, is a lot of the times uh, monistic philosophies are structured as holy Legos. The universe is built out of a little, lot of little parts that are the same part, but kind of what differentiates uh, Aztec dualism and also or Aztec non-dualism and also the kind of non-dualism present in Star Wars is that it is more like a river. It's more like a force that drives all of the action of the universe. It allows for creation and destruction. It's more like 
oil that allows the machine of the universe to move rather than um, something that's very static. Another distinguish distinguishing feature about Olam that's also related to Star Wars is it seems to arrive um, at a goal, and it seems to go in cycles. For the Aztecs, when Olam reached like a critical low point, the gods would kill themselves, the world would end, and then they would reincarnate and was born anew. They had, they theorized that there were several apocalypse, and every time that Olam reached a certain breaking point, that it would just kind of go in a loop de loop and start over again. Uh, and if you're thinking that multiple apocalypses is possible you might be living in the year 2020 um yeah um another kind of brand of sect of philosophies that the force seems to have some connection to is various forms of eastern mysticism taoism buddhism zoroastrianism uh so a little bit i'll talk a little bit about each i think the biggest thing that it would seem that lucas uh pinched from taoism is the idea of kind of a universal good and bad. In the Star Wars canon, there is considered to be a light side of the Force and a dark side of the Force. Um, and what exactly these two things are is the, uh, up for debate, but there's often uh, presented a sort of uh, balance between these two sects of the Force, which is somewhat similar to what occurs in Taoism, because Taoism is a dualistic religion that views the world in terms of kind of two disparate yang and yang parts and thinks that uh, uh, striving to achieve a balance between those two in the world usually by not doing anything to interrupt the existing balance between the two, is the kind of most preferable ethical action from a cosmic point of view. Um, but however, just as there is debate in between amongst fans of Star Wars about what uh, balance in the Force means, uh, part of which is because the different people who made different Star Wars media had different interpretations of what that meant, so did different things with it, uh, in the real world and in the Star Wars universe, there's also kind of academic debates about uh, what balance in the Force in the Star Wars universe and what balance uh, in the Tao, the kind of omnipresent uh, cosmic force in Taoism means. Uh, does someone want to talk about Zoroastrianism? So Zoroastrianism is another religion, a very outdated religion. You don't see it practiced much anymore, but it's definitely relevant to the Star Wars universe um, that believed that you know, that there is a constant struggle between good and evil. It's also often considered the first monotheistic religion and that everything, every, even the smallest, like, day-to-day -day struggle could be placed in a larger universalistic struggle for good and evil, which is similar to what the cosmic force is, um, this kind of larger narrative about the uh, fluctuations between good and evil. So Zoroastrianism was about that and about trying to achieve balance between order and chaos. And yeah, the thing that uh, Sophia talked about how it's kind of an outdated religion, so to speak, is not meant to say that like its principles are no longer relevant from a philosophical standpoint, but rather that uh, its numbers are rapidly declining. Uh, and it will probably die in a couple, a couple of decades, maybe. So then in addition to the uh, cosmic force, with, you've got the living force. And basically what the living force, it's all about like, it goes through everything. It goes through, it, you can find it anywhere in the universe and it connects all, it connects all things. And so then there's the interesting question of, does, what does it, does it really connect to everything? Like can droids, for example, use the force. And because they're, if the force goes through all living things and like it goes through rocks, it goes through trees, it goes through people. What, where is, why can a droid not be force sensitive? Like what makes the difference between a, a droid and a person? If they both have the force going through them and they're both aware of themselves. I actually also have a question. Can clones use the Force, or do they have to kind of have a unique personhood that differentiates them? I believe 
there's it's a little iffy. I think you can make clones that can, can use the force, but they often go insane. Yeah. Like for example, there's a Jedi called what's his name? Uh Joris Sabaoth, I believe is his name. So he was an he was a Jedi and then, you know, he he did his Jedi life and then eventually he died uh at the end of his Jedi life. And later, so, someone called Thrawn tried to clone him and, well, no, sorry, he found the clone of him guarding a facility and he took this guy with him. But the problem is because he was, he's, he basically had like the same, he had Joris Sabayoth's body and he had his force, he had his, <laughs> he had his force abilities, but he didn't have like, I guess his identity almost. So he basically was going insane because the con juxtaposition of that yeah i think there's also there's actually one important thing that i think we forgot to talk about and it should be important to mention for the viewer's sake is the idea of force sensitivity yeah it's an idea in the star wars universe that certain individuals uh certain sentient or non-sentient beings have a uh connection to the force in which they're able to perceive both the cosmic uh, perceive the cosmic force and what's going on with that in various ways uh, which often means that uh force sensitive users can do things like see into the future or uh other weird spooky stuff, um, but also that they have a, a connection to the living force that allows them to uh, to perform extraordinary physical feats, including uh, moving physical objects, tricking people's, uh, changing people's minds about things with uh, Jedi mind tricks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and I think, I'm not 100% sure, but I do believe there are instances in Star Wars canon of uh, clones of non-force sensitive individuals, in this case, uh, Jango Fett, being able to have by random chance, once they were cloned, of having having force sensitivity. I think there are some examples of clones in the Jedi clone army having force sensitivity, but not 100% sure about that. Okay, I have a, another question. Uh, do you guys think that the predestination and the dreams of the future that force-sensitive individuals get, do you think that is evidence for a fatalistic world or in other words is everything in star wars planned out or does there exist room for free will in the star wars universe well i that's kind of an interesting topic because let's you've got like anakin in the prequel trilogy his whole throughout this whole trilogy he's slowly he's he's lo he's starting to freak out because he he's getting visions of people he loves dying so he sees a vision of his mother dying because his she gets attacked so he goes to try to rescue her but he's too late and then he has a vision of his wife dying and in trying to prevent her death by he tries to learn a new force ability to try to prevent her death but he ends up killing her so you could argue to a certain extent that he, it is like you always will if you try to uh, make some make something that you saw in a force vision not happen you could argue that you'll just make it happen anyway so you could argue that it is determined yeah and i think the stuff from the original trilogy also backs this up so when luke leaves his training with yoda pre preemptively in order to save his friends from being captured by darth vader uh in the city of bespin uh he ultimately his kind of teacher uh jedi master of yoda says to him that it's kind of futile to try to change the future based on a force premonition and that it'll like inevitably just make things worse or kind of lead to the thing that happened in the first place, kind of like a bootstraps time travel paradox. Uh, and it does end up being the case that Luke goes there, fails, gets his hand cut off, um, and ends up not kind of finishing his teachings and everyone's kind of worse off for the wear. So I do think it kind of implies a sort of fatalistic thing, but it's also important to recognize that in the series, there's kind of never a point in which characters receive information about the force that is so incredibly deterministic that it would deter them from pursuing goals so it may be that the force is selectively the cosmic force is selectively showing them visions in order to uh, kind of enhance its own agenda i.e because it knew that um because it knew that anakin would ultimately later end up bringing balance to the force the force may have decided to prematurely show him the visions of his wife dying in childbirth in order to uh, spark the events that would ultimately lead to the end of the original star wars series you guys talk about um, how the Force has kind of a goal in mind, how it's going towards an end. Can you talk, like, just a little bit more about that? What 
do we know in the Star Wars universe what is that goal and kind of do the Jedi or do the Sith uh, interact with it in any way? So throughout Star Wars, you've basically got this constant, I guess, seesaw of the Force. You've got periods where the Sith reign, reign and they're really powerful, and then you've got periods where the Jedi are. So it, it's almost like the, it's, it's the Force is trying to like achieve balance, and it's just going all over the place because of it. What I'm imagining right now, you can include this or not, is like one of those crazy graphs, but like the limit is zero. So just kind of more on that, is the seesawing goal directed in any way? Or do, is is imbalance necessary to balance, do you guys think? Like, would the Force have a purpose if there wasn't disruptions in the Force? Or does is it disturbances or... I think this is a hard. I think it's a hard question to answer because, again, like what for the balance and the force means is so inconsistent between portrayals of in a, of media. But I, the kind of thing that I, that I, have taken to myself to be canon is kind of the, the similar Taoist idea of that. In general, if the universe is let to do its thing, then things will go smoothly. But it's kind of like egoistic individuals who are like hungry and seek power, who disrupt the for the disrupt the balance of the force by gaining too much power. Right. So. Uh, uh, for example, Darth Raven, like uh, accumulating massive amounts of power uh, during uh, kind of that period of the Star Wars history, and then things kind of got course corrected, or the thousands of years in which the Jedi ruled over the galaxy, where the Sith pretty much didn't exist. That kind of being another example of how uh, one side got too powerful because individuals were uh, unwise and egoistic, which eventually led to uh, kind of violent rebalancing uh, in each of those instances through like very dramatic events. So if one wanted to act in accordance with the way of the force, you're saying that they would be unegoistic, right? Uh, generally, yeah. Okay. But the force also flows through living things and causes their actions. So I'm wondering if there's like a contradiction here, because if actions are caused by the force and those reactions can also be disturbances in the force, how do you how do you think we would reconcile that? Like presumably the force, if it's like kind of fatalistic, is causing these individuals to be egoistic and thereby disrupting itself. I don't know if the force is really as much of a direct control. Yeah. Like it's not con- completely controlling everything you do. It's not making you go here. It's not making you do this. It's more of kind of uh, in general messing with the galaxy and it can nudge you in a certain direction but it can't ever make you do something yeah i think the force is more of a nudger rather than a you know something that's kind of all controlling and and this debate obviously kind of mirrors the uh you know debates in uh you know theology especially christian theology where it's like you know if god's goal is to prevent prevent evil and he's also all powerful why doesn't he just like will evil out of existence i think it's there's kind of that same tension and so you know, in in the universe and out of the universe, different people will have different interpretations where either the force is more powerful, um, but like less kind of pure in terms of preserving the balance, or the force is less powerful but has pure intentions. If you're interested in that concept of uh, the kind of conflict between God, God's existence, and trying to resolve evil, I recommend you listen to last podcast where we discussed the problem of evil among other justifications for and against God. Uh, one more thing that it would be kind of a crime not to talk about is conceptions of the force as non-dualistic or uh, people and individuals resisting the dualistic nature of the force. The kind of uh, classic example is Kriya from Knights of the Old Republic 2, which is a video game that some people say you should play, uh, where there's this particular kind of radical individual who proposes that uh, the force is a sort of oppressive sort of controller and that we should attempt to resist ourselves from the uh, kind of cosmic fate of the force in various ways. Uh, and she also rejects the kind of dualistic nature of the force by understanding it as less of a good and evil and more of a gray area, which is also something that just, that's explored in the prequel, or sorry, in the sequel trilogy to a relatively large extent. So uh, again, the fact that it ties so much into religion should tell you that George Lucas really made this intentionally, uh, very deliberately and very well to be a 
kind of dramatic reflection of how human religion works and to still into its core elements because uh, there's also debates in uh, all sorts of religions, probably more so the Eastern religions for this specific element about uh, uh, rejecting the inherent dualism of the universe or whether or not that dualism is truly a binar binaristic dualism or one with uh, kind of shades of gray. Just kind of going back to the motif of resisting fate, we see this kind of played out in similar ways through human fiction all across history. For a particular well-known example, the story that um, Quentin and Bauer told about Anakin earlier, uh, obviously the story of the prequels, uh, is quite similar to um, the story of Oedipus and Antigone, uh, or just the whole Oedipus cycle in general, which is also, uh, you know, in threes, C curious, interesting. Uh, but uh, where we also have a man who tries to resist fate with all he can and ends up succumbing to it and being completely destroyed for the rest of his life. Um, this is an idea rehashed throughout history and one I think still warrants consideration, whether we should try to resist fate, if, even if it's a bad one, or go with the forces of nature that guide us. Yeah, with fate, it's kind of like gambling. The house always wins. Well, I guess with that, uh, we can wrap this up. Um, if you uh, enjoyed this podcast or listening to it, um, please like, subscribe, share it with any of your friends. Um, if you want to come on to the show like Bauer has done, uh, you can email us at harkerphilosophyclub at gmail.com. Or you can also email us if you have any questions, comments, concerns about future topics or past ones. Uh, thank you.